Hello everyone and welcome to Introducing Statistics in Research Part 2. So in Part 1 we looked at some of the key concepts um, such as uh, populations and samples um, and how we can use mainly descriptive statistics to help us summarise data uh, using measures of central tendency and variability. We introduced the idea of the standard normal distribution and also probability and statistical significance. So in part two, what we're going to be doing is building on that, um, particularly statistical significance, in something called a null hypothesis significance testing framework. We're going to look at the different approaches to statistical testing um, and how you might choose between those based on the different kind of research scenarios you're presented with. And also look at interpreting statistical tests um, and how it's not all about statistical significance. And we'll also look at quality appraisal in um, quantitative research. So trying to think about how we can judge whether the statistics that have come from a piece of research uh, are quality um, or, or not. Okay, so um, to look through the learning outcomes for part two then, so by the end of this session you should be able to describe null hypothesis significance testing. You should be able to define key concepts including the p-value, effect sizes, um, what we mean by research design and you should be able to identify the parametric um, data assumptions. You should also be able to identify core inferential statistical techniques that are used for exploring differences between groups or conditions or time points and for exploring relationships between variables. But you should also be able to describe some different approaches to quality assurance in quantitative research and to be able to articulate the strengths and the limitations of statistics in research. So before we go any further, I think it's helpful to look back at this slide we looked at in part one, thinking about why we need statistics, what's, what's the point of them. Um, so we've seen that statistics can help us to organise, summarise and simplify our data so we can communicate it to other people. But we have introduced the idea that we can use it to predict um, the likelihood of events occurring, the likelihood of changes in variables or differences between groups occurring. and we've introduced the idea of using statistics to make inferences or to draw conclusions about a population from which a sample has been drawn. What we're going to be really looking at then in this session is thinking about hypothesis or, or theory testing and using statistics in em empirical research as evidence to support a hypothesis or, or, or not. Um, so hopefully by the end of this session we'll also see that Statistics can play a role in that evidence-informed decision-making. Um, and also, we'll look at some of the markers of what uh, quality in quantitative research and how we can use statistics to judge that. But we have to remember uh, all the way through this that our statistics are only as, as good as our empirical studies are reliable and valid. So it's all based on, really, the quality of the research and the research design about how much uh, weight we can put on the conclusions we draw from our statistics. So as I've said before, there are, broadly speaking, there are two categories and we're going to be looking at inferential statistics today. So this is really where we use knowledge about the way the way data behaves to identify whether values we've observed in a sample are likely to have occurred by chance or if it suggests something about the relationships between variables or the differences between groups or so on. And the idea is that we can use that um, if our research is robust to make inferences about the parameters in the population. So in part one we introduced the idea of probability and statistical significance and we link that to the normal standard normal distribution. So this is what we looked at in part one. We can see that we have the bell curve, uh, the normal distribution which is a symmetrical distribution with generally sloping sides. We can see the values in the tails are far less likely to uh, occur by, by chance um, and actually this is where we get the 0 0.05 um, cutoff for statistical significance. 
So we know that within a normal distribution, the vast majority of data points are going to fall within minus 2 and plus 2 standard deviations around our mean. So we can use that to draw conclusions. Um, so what I mean by that is um, when we're looking at statistical significance, what we're trying to decide is how likely is the finding that we have observed to have occurred by chance? Uh, how likely is the finding that we've observed to um, have occurred um, if the null hypothesis is true, that there's nothing going on? Uh, and so if we have a look at this representation here, what we're saying is that um, when you get to the tails of a distribution, very unlikely to observe a value that is that extreme. So if you observe a value in the tails of the distribution, um, we say it's a very low probability of observing that um, value, then we can reject the null hypothesis that there is nothing going on. But if we have a very high probability of observing a value, so for example it falls within where the bulk of, of scores would be expected to fall, then we say that um, it has a very high probability of being observed and we have to retain the null hypothesis. Um, so if it's something that we're likely to have observed just by chance, then we have to retain a null hypothesis. If it's very um, unlikely to have been observed by chance, then we can say that there is something going on and we can reject the null hypothesis. So what we need is a value that will allow us to assess the likelihood of identifying a difference between the means, for example, in this example, that is as or more extreme than the value we have observed. And that statistic is the p-value, the probability level, also called the, the probability value. And that's essentially what this cutoff is here. So what we would be saying is we've generated a statistic which is based on the difference between these sample means that is so unlikely to be to have happened if the null hypothesis is correct. It's, it's so unlikely that actually we can reject the null hypothesis and say, no, there is something going on. There is a genuine difference between our groups. So I mentioned there that um, what we have to do is create a... We have to take our sample means and convert those into a statistic and then we can look at whether that is unlikely to have happened by chance or not. So essentially we've looked at the normal distribution but there are lots of other different types of distribution which are all based on statistics. Um, what you would normally do if you're doing this by hand is you would look at your observed value from your data, you calculate the statistic for example, based on the difference between the two samples means. And you compare that figure, that observed figure, to a table of critical values based on the characteristics of our data and use that to decide whether we have a statistically significant result or not. Now, don't worry about that too much now. We're going to actually look at some examples of that in a, in a bit. But what we have are lots of different types of distribution um, of statistics. So this is something called uh, a distribution, an F distribution. This is um, a distribution, a T distribution, and this is something we're going to look at in a bit. Um, this is a chi-square distribution. So there are all sorts of different statistics that you can draw on. And choosing between them will depend on what your data looks like. So we'll actually be looking at that uh, in a little bit as well. But you've got lots of tools in your toolbox that you can use if you're doing statistical analysis and one of the skills is to choose between them. We're actually going to be looking at the t-distribution in a little bit more detail uh, later on and it's very similar actually to a normal distribution but there are some key differences and we'll talk through that later. So the p-value helps us to determine whether our results are statistically significant or not or not. The p-value is the probability of obtaining the observed sample results when the null hypothesis is true. And quite often what we say is um, how likely are our observed results if the null hypothesis was true, that there was nothing going on. Now, in different fields, the, the threshold at which we um, choose identify something as statistically significant or not 
uh, can differ. Now in the social sciences and in a lot of health sciences, we tend to choose a cutoff of 0 0.05. Um, so the p-value, we would say if something is 0 0.05 or less than, that's what the symbol means, 0 0.05, then we can reject a null hypothesis and we can say that something is statistically significant. But in some other, um, in some pharmaceutical research and things like that, you might have to have a much lower threshold than, than that, so 0 0.001 or so on. But what this means is um, if we were doing um, the same piece of research a hundred times, five times out of that hundred, we would say that something is statistically significant when it really wasn't. So that's a one in 20 chance of saying that there's something going on when actually there isn't and the null hypothesis shouldn't be rejected. So a point of that p-value, which is also sometimes called alpha, we mentioned that in part one, a point zero 0.05 is usually seen as a suitable, an appropriate cutoff uh, of a risk of saying that there is something going on, that there is a statistically significant result when actually there isn't. But as I said, in some fields, you might have to lower that p-value. Um, so it's 0 0.01, for example. So only one times in 100, you would make um, the mistake of saying something's going on when there isn't. Um, but in if, unless otherwise stated, usually the p-value is 0 0.05. So if we're just looking at these um, p-values, imagine these have been reported, I'd like you to just go through them and decide, based on that cutoff of 0 0.05, which of those would you class as a statistically significant result, just based on the p-value, uh, and which of those aren't. So I'm going to give you a minute to have a go at that. Pause this video, look at each one and decide whether you would say that that was statistically significant or not, and then we'll look at the answers. Okay, so I'll assume that you've um, paused the video and had a go, and we'll look at the answers now. So a p-value here of 0 0.001, that is lower than 0 0.05, so that is statistically significant. Uh, this value here, 0 0.06, is larger than 0 0.05, so we would class that as non-significant. Now we say that something is non-significant, we don't say it's insignificant. Um, because those have very different meanings. What we're saying here is we don't have the statistical evidence to say that there's something going on. So we say that this result is non-significant. This result is right on the borderline, um, but that would be classed as statistically significant. This is a lot less than 0 0.05, so that is statistically significant. Now this is just over statistical significance. So if we rounded that up, that would be 0 0.06, so that would be non-significant well. So I mentioned uh, a few slides ago that there are lots of different distributions of statistics other than the standard normal distribution and that this reflects the number of different statistical techniques that you can apply to data. Now you might be thinking well how on earth would you choose between them or do you need to can you just pick any and this is where you really need to understand how the research has been conducted and designed. The first thing you need to understand is about the research design. What sorts of things are you looking to test? What are you looking at? And the second thing you need to look at is whether your data meets something called the parametric assumptions. And we're going to break that down now and look at both of those things. But essentially, an understanding of these two things will help you to identify which kinds of statistical tests you should run in which situations so that you know you're calculating a probability value that makes sense. So the first thing, and I'm not going to go into too much detail about this because um, I'm assuming that you've, you've looked at this um, previously, but what do we mean by research design? So a research design is the framework of methods and procedures that you've adopted to answer your research questions or test your hypotheses. So in relation to doing analysis, we tend to break research designs down into a number of different types. You can have between groups designs, and that's where you have independent uh, groups of participants and you are looking at the differences between them. You have within groups designs, which is when you're looking at all the same individuals, but you're looking at them in different scenarios, different conditions or time points. And you might have a mixed between within groups design. 
So that's where you've got an element of between groups and within groups, and we'll look at an example in a moment. Another type of design might be something like cross-sectional, or sometimes they're called correlational, and that's often where you're looking at information that's available, um, that's naturally occurring, uh, that um, you're not deliberately manipulating, you're not manipulating groups that people um, are allocated to, you're not manipulating the scenario, the conditions, or so on. You're just looking at what is out there and naturally varying um, in the world. So as I said, with between groups, this is where we're going to be analysing the differences between independent groups of people. So this is sometimes called independent samples. And it's where people are allocated to, for example, a control group or a treatment group. The within groups design is also sometimes called repeated measures. And that's where we're looking at the same group of people, but we're looking at their scores on something in under different conditions or at different time points, so before and after an intervention. So we're looking at perhaps change scores. In a mixed design, as I said, you can have an element of both of those things. So that might be where you've got, uh, you're looking at the differences between a control and a treatment group before and after an intervention and to see what the impact is. When I s talked about kind of correlational cross-sectional designs, that's where we're not really making any manipulations ourselves. Quite often it's where we're using survey methods, it's using questionnaires to look at how different variables co-vary, which is when they, they change systematically um, in relation to each other. So that's another kind of branch uh, of different uh, research designs. Now, which research design we have will affect what type of analysis we're looking to do. So before I go any further, I need to introduce some more terminology. And this is about variables. So I've talked about how you know, might be looking at the differences between groups of people on a variable. Or you might be looking at the differences in or the relationships between variables. So let's just take a moment to think, what do I actually mean by variable? So a variable is a characteristic or a value which has some variability, some variance, or it has the potential to change. Now, within that, we could we could break down variables into two broad types. We can talk about independent variables, which are also sometimes called predictor variables. And that's a variable that is either manipulated by the researcher or we're looking at naturally occurring groups, things that we're not directly manipulating, but that naturally vary, um, which don't depend on any other variable in the research. For example, uh, a naturally um, varying variable in uh, or naturally occurring groups would be groups based on gender. So we're not directly manipulating gender, um, but we're looking at the impact that gender has on other variables. So quite often an independent variable is the thing that's directly manipulated by the researcher. It's often denoted by an X, um, but it can be thought of as the variable that stands alone. It's the thing that isn't influenced by anything else in your research design, or it shouldn't be. A dependent variable is also sometimes called the outcome or the measurement variable. And this is a variable whose value depends on that of another variable in your, in your research. It's often called the measurement variable because we look to see when we make changes to something else, we look at the measurable impact that change has on that variable. It's often denoted by Y. Um, and so what we're really looking at in a lot of the research is if we manipulate X, what measurable impact will that have on Y? So again, these sorts of um, this terminology has an impact on understanding how you choose between different types of statistical test. So very broadly, we tend to be looking at either um, looking at differences between groups or relationships between variables. Now, that's a, that's a gross source of a simplification, but it is sometimes quite useful to try and think of how you can categorise different statistical approaches. Within that, we have to be mindful of how our data performs, how it behaves. Now, in part one, we looked at the impact of having a normal distribution on how we could predict um, observed values as behaving within that. So we can use it to decide when a, v a value that we've observed is likely to have occurred by chance or not, or so on. 
So one of the, um, the important things is that data that is normally distributed, you understand how the mean, the median and the mode operate and that they're essentially identical. When you don't have a normal distribution, you can't make the same assumptions of your data. Now, why have I talked about that? Well, broadly, there are two types of inferential statistic. There are parametric statistics, non-parametric statistics. So parametric statistics make more assumptions about how your data should look and behave. It's typically based on the means. So we have to have a normal distribution so that our mean um, is a, a good measure of central tendency to use. So it's a good representation of typical values in our data set. So parametric assumptions, uh, parametric statistics, make a lot of assumptions about how your data looks in order to make accurate predictions. Now sometimes, as we've already seen, our data doesn't behave in that way. We have positively or negatively skewed variables, for example. And so there are alternative statistics called non-parametric or distribution-free statistics. Now they tend to be less powerful, which is why you don't just use them by default. But they make fewer requirements of how your data should behave. And one of those is that it's, it, it doesn't require your data to be normally distributed. So if you have variables that are very skewed, large levels of positive or negative skew, then it's usually safer to use a non-parametric test. So the reason that these um, tests are more suitable in that sim situation is that they're typically based on the medians rather than the means as a measure of central tendency. So you can start to see how when we talked about descriptive statistics as being the foundation to understanding inferential statistics, you can start to see what we meant by that. Um, and so having a good understanding of why means and medians are better measures of central tendency in different situations, that'll help you choose between parametric statistics and non-parametric statistics. And these are all important considerations. And we're going to bring those together in a moment so you can see exactly how all of these sorts of things come together. But parametric statistical tests, as well as the normal distribution, which you can see here, um, make a number of other assumptions about your data. So one of those is that the outcome variable you're looking at must be interval or ratio level. Now, if you think about it, that makes sense because most of these parametric tests are based on means. So if you've got an ordinal or a nominal variable, an outcome, you can't calculate a mean for that. So instantly you can't use a parametric test. You have to have something called independence of observations. And that means essentially that my score on a variable shouldn't be influencing your score on, some, on a variable. Another assumption of parametric tests is about variance. Now we looked at how we calculate variance in part one, and it's a very useful concept to understanding inferential statistics. But essentially, if we have um, a situation where we're looking at the difference in scores between two groups, the variance of the scores of those two groups needs to be roughly the same in a parametric test. So the spread outness of scores for each of the two groups needs to be roughly the same in order for us to use a parametric test. Now, this final assumption here is a bit more tricky to understand, but essentially there has to be a linear relationship between your variables. What does that mean? It essentially means you could fit a straight line to it. If you have an unusual relationship between variables where it's all curved or, or kind of you've got like an upside down S or something, and that's, it, that's called a curvy linear relationship that really wouldn't be appropriate to a lot of the parametric tests that, that you'll, you use. Now, don't worry too much about these because how you investigate them will differ depending on the different test you're looking at. Um, but if you wanted to understand more about how these parametric assumptions work and how they're tested in different scenarios, I'd really recommend reading Julie Pallant's SBSS Survival Manual. She has a brilliant introduction to lots of um, the parametric assumptions, and then she'll actually talk about how they're applied in different scenarios and different types of test. So if you're interested in learning more about that, I'd recommend reading her book.
And as I said, that's available as an ebook through the library. So why does it matter? Well, as I've mentioned, um, if we are using a parametric uh, test, we're assuming that the mean is a good representation of a typical score. We're assuming that we have a normal distribution. So that that's what the mean is. It's the center of our distribution, essentially. Now, if we don't have a normal distribution, our mean doesn't mean that anymore. It's not necessarily a good measure of central tendency. So if we use inferential statistics to base our um, assessment of probability on that, we've got some flawed logic going on there. This isn't going to be the best measure of central tendency. We should probably be using something like a median instead, and that's what a non-parametric test will tend to do. So if we think back to part one, and we remember that we had a mean age of 30, a median age of 26, and a modal age of 21, we know that we have positive skew because our mean is higher on the scale than our median and our mode. And so probably a median might be a better measure of central tendency. So because we have a positively skewed variable, we might need to use a non-parametric inferential test. Um, but we, we're not going to go into that too much detail now. That's just a reminder of what we looked at in part one. As well as measures of central tendency, obviously, if you have a normal distribution, you'd normally use a mean and a standard deviation. If you don't have a normal distribution, then the standard deviation might not be the best measure of variability. So it has a knock on effect. OK, so what does that all mean? So I'm going to share this with you. So this is by the University of Sydney, um, and it's a really useful tool. What we can see are all these different names. So independent t-test, Mann-Whitney test, dependent t-test, regression, Manover. All of these are different types of inferential statistical test, and they are best suited to different scenarios. And how you choose between them is by knowing your research design and knowing whether you've met the parametric assumptions for the data or not. And we're going to apply this to choose a type of test in a moment. But what we can see here is there are essentially seven steps in selecting a statistical test. But what else we can see is when we have met the parametric assumptions, so we've got yes to this. We could do one type of a set of test, in this case, an independent t-test, and that is a parametric test. But what we also have, if we don't meet the parametric assumptions, so we have to answer no at this point, there is a non-parametric test equivalent. So the non-parametric equivalent of an independent t-test is something called a Mann-Whitney test. So for a lot of op a lot of these types of analysis, there's both a parametric and a non-parametric version. There isn't for every type of test, but there is for quite a lot of them. So just to illustrate that, if we're looking at a correlation, so that's how two um, continuous lab variables or potentially ordinal variables, um, how they relate to each other, we're looking at either the parametric version, which would be a Pearson. So both the variables would have to be interval or ratio level, and both would have to be normally distributed. Or if we've got ordinal variables or non-normal normally distributed variables, we could use the Spearman's correlation test. We've already looked at the independent t-test and the alternative non-parametric Mann-Whitney u-test. Um, but there are others as well. So this just gives you an idea. Matched paired is also called dependent t-test and so on. So there are lots of options out there. So if we look back at our example, so our hypothesis was that there will be a difference in the mean recall scores for two groups of participants, a control group and a group who've taken part in the memory training intervention. So what can we tell from that hypothesis? Well, we can tell that we need to compare between two groups. And we can also tell that this is a between groups design because some people will be in a control group and some people are going to be in a memory training group. So 
our independent variable, the thing that we're manipulating, is whether someone is allocated to the control group or the treatment group, the memory training intervention. Our dependent variable, the thing that we're seeing if there's a measurable impact on, is recall score. So let's have a go at using this statistics flowchart, which was developed by the University of Sydney. We have to start at this point. So how many vari dependent variables do we have? Well, we have one, which was recall. So we would start here. The next thing we have to think about is what what's the type of dependent variable do we have? Is it a continuous score or categorical? Well, in this example, it's a continuous recall score. So we would follow this branch. How many independent variables do we have? Now we've actually only got one independent variable and it has two levels. So the independent variable, if you remember, was group allocation, whether they're in the control group or the treatment group. So we have one independent variable, which is con group allocation. It's categorical because you're in one group or the other. There are two because there's a control group and a treatment group. And there are different people in each one. So there's some. you're either going to be in the control group or you're going to be in the intervention group. You won't be in both. So this point, we know we're going to have to do either an independent t-test or a Mann-Whitney test. And we would have to look at whether our data meets the parametric data assumptions. So is it normally distributed, for example, in order to decide between these two things? So if we imagine that we've looked at our data, it is normally distributed. And actually what we found is the group one, the control group, had a score, and there were 20 people in that group, they had a score of 24 and a standard deviation of five. So we know that the um, most people are going to score within, uh, or many people are going to score within minus one standard deviation and plus one standard deviation around that. So they're going to score between uh, 19 and uh, 29, around that value of 24. And group 2, or intervention, had a mean of 20 and um, a, uh, sorry, our group 2 also had 20 individuals in it and it had a mean score of 20 with a standard deviation of, uh, of 4, so they scored between um, the vast majority of people, 68% of people are going to score between 16 and 24. We know we have a mean difference of between the group's means of, of four points on the recall scale. Now we've imagined that we've checked the data and it was all normally distributed and so we can use a t-test to do that. Now there are lots of different ways of doing this. There are different types of statistical package. But for things like t-tests, there are some very good online t-test calculators. And we can plug our information into that and we can get a result, a probability value. So if I click on this link, it takes us to something called GraphPad and we can enter our data. Now there are different approaches to doing that. What we have is we know the mean score, our standard deviation and n, the number of observations we have. So we can enter that. And so you see it's changed the table where we enter our data. So what we need to do is for group one, put in the mean, which was 24, the standard deviation, which was five, and the n, the number of observations, which was 20. For group two, we need to put in the mean score, which was 20, the standard deviation, which was four, and the number of observations, which, which was 20 again. We need to choose the unpaired t-test, which is the equivalent, this is an independent samples t-test, because we've got people who are uh, different people in each of the groups, so they're unpaired. And then we can click Calculate Now, and it produces a result. So what we can see is that we have a mean group difference of four points, which is what we'd already calculated. We have a t-value which is um, the our observed t-value of 2.79. And we have um, a p-value that's calculated from that of 0 
So if we look back at our slides, imagine that this is our distribution. What we're saying is that these are a distribution of t values. Now our t value is greater than 2. This is just an illustration, so this is based on a smaller sample size than ours. Um, but our t value is greater than 2, so actually it's in the tails of the distribution and it's to the point of being very unlikely to obs have observed a t-value of that size or greater if the null hypothesis was correct, that there was nothing going on. So what we can say is, well, there is something going on. And we know that because actually we have a p-value that's calculated exactly of 0 0.008, which is less than 0 0.05, which is statistically significant. So we know that there is a statistical, statistically significant difference between the means of group 1 and group 2, that that is a difference representing four points. And actually, if we think back to our hypothesis, we can reject the null hypothesis, but this finding might be in a slightly different direction than we expected, because it would suggest that people who are in the memory training group are significantly worse at recall than people in the control group. So that would be a really interesting finding to unpick. I've just included a link here so you can actually see how this works. So when you have calculated a t-value, you can what you would normally do is look that up on, this is uh, critical values. And if your value for t is larger than the appropriate critical value, then you can reject the null hypothesis. Now our calculator has done that for us and it's told us the exact p-value, which is 0 0.008, so we don't have to do that step. But that's how we had to do it longhand in the past. So we can tell from our results that we have a statistically significant difference between the two groups' means, that we can be fairly sure that that hasn't occurred essentially by chance, that we can reject the null hypothesis with some confidence. Um, so what that p-value can't tell us is how accurate an estimate of the mean difference our um, score, our statistics, are of the population mean difference um, between the groups would be. What we need, um, we need additional information to be able to do that. And if we look back at the website, we can see that um, the graph pad uh, test results have given us something else. They've given us confidence intervals um, and we're going to look at those now. So what we have to remember when we're doing analysis is um, that the p-value is not the whole picture of our results. Um, so it can tell us about the probability level but it, um, we need other information as well. Um, and if we think back to the first part of this introduction to statistics, we talked about how our statistics are things like our sample mean or the mean difference between the groups. Um, those are statistics and they are estimates of parameters in the population. Um, so we tend to use 95% confidence intervals and what that means is that um, so we've got an estimate of the in this of our samples of a mean difference of four points and we could say that we expect the population mean difference to be somewhere between 1.10 and 6.90. So the closer those two values are, the lower bound and the upper bound, um, the more precise the estimate is. But again, we, we know that um, the p-value is not the whole picture um, but, and so we can complement that with information um, about the precision of our estimates. But there's also something else in terms of the interpretation of results. Uh, so just because something is statistically significant doesn't mean that it is clinically significant or it's practically useful. So what we also need to do alongside a p-value is to calculate and interpret something called an effect size, which is um, a measure of the magnitude um, or the size of the effect. So the size of the difference between the groups or conditions or the strength of the relationship between variables. Um, so it provides, effect sizes provide a system for telling us how large the effects we've seen in our data really are. There are criteria um, that you can measure uh, against to see if you found something that's a very small, probably inconsistent level, um, 
uh, moderate level or perhaps very large and very consistent um, uh, relationship. Uh, so the effect size is something that's very useful and again this is something else that a lot of journals are now requiring authors to, to publish alongside their statistical results. There are lots of different types of effect size so there are things like Pearson's R so that tends to be used more when you have you're looking at correlations so that's where variables vary together in a meaningful way. Um, you have things like eta squared or partial eta squared and um, those sorts of things tend to be used with um, things like ANOVAs which are where you're looking at the differences between uh, three or more groups uh, of um, participants or three or more conditions or, th or things like that um, and you have things like Cohen's D. So a lot of the rules of thumb for interpreting effect sizes, so small, medium and large, tends to have been developed from the work of Cohen. Um, so if you look on the library ebook search box, you'll find one of Cohen's um, books about effect sizes and power in statistical analysis. I think it's the 1988 version. And he talks through what, what these mean and a lot of the rules of thumb that are presented here are from, uh, from that work. Uh, so, for example, if we wanted to look at whether the difference between two groups means was small, medium or large, then we would probably use Cohen's D, which is this one and so on. Um, so we can see that a small sized effect would be something that we would calculate at 0.2 to 0.49. A medium sized effect would be 0.5 to 0.79 and a large sized effect would be 0.8 and over. Um, so we're just going to have a look at that. So we've thought about, uh, we've been using a, a t-test to compare the means of our two groups which were the control group and a memory training intervention. Um, and we used a t-test to do that. So we want to produce a measure of effect uh, to, to tell us how large the difference we, we identified, which was four points. How practically large is that? How useful is that, that finding? Um, so how it does that is it looks at the means of the two groups it's divided by the what we call the pooled standard deviation so pooled is just the kind of the, the standard deviation of the two groups um, and to actually calculate SD pooled standard deviation pooled we have to take the square root of um, the standard deviation squared for group one plus the standard deviation squared for group two and divide it by two so we have to do that step first and then we can plug in the other values um, into that formula. So if we remember that group 1 had a mean score of 24 with a standard deviation of 5, and group 2 had a mean score of 20 with a standard deviation of 4, we can, first of all, we can calculate our standard deviation pooled value. So that's 5 squared plus 4 squared divided by 2 squared, the square root of that. So that's 4.53. Um, and then we can take the mean of our group minus the other mean, um, divide it by uh, 4.53 and we get a value for D of 0.88. So um, there are lots of uh, effect size calculators out there on, on the web so you don't have to remember this formula um, but uh, it, I think it's helpful to know how it's calculated and Cohen's D for t-tests is something that's, that's fairly straightforward to do but there are lots of uh, calculators uh, as we saw for t-tests, there are lots of calculators for different types of effect size as well. But if we look back at our rule of thumb, what we can see is that we would have, um, based on this, a large effect size. So we now know that we have a statistically significant difference between the groups, that the mean difference we observed was four points. We know the precision um, with which that's estimated because of our confidence intervals. So we know the range within which the, the population mean difference would fall. And now we know that that represents um, a large sized effect. So that means that the finding we have is likely to be observable from descriptive statistics, which it is, and it's likely to be consistent as well. So we've had a bit of a whistle stop tour of all the sorts of things as well as a p-value that you need to think about when you're looking at inferential statistics. But it really goes beyond that as well. Um, and one of the things that uh, is really important to remember is that just because something is published 
doesn't mean that it's good quality. Um, so whenever you're reading any research using statistics or, or for qualitative research as well, you need to be thinking about the quality of that. So you need to approach it with a critical eye. Um, and one of the things that I find is quite helpful uh, to sort of structure that um, are using uh, reporting guidelines and checklists to think about how good a piece of work is. Um, so I've just provided two different websites that have a collection of different checklists. So I'll take you through those now. So this is called the Equator Network. Um, and one of its, its aims is to kind of enhance quality um, and the transparency of reporting in, in research. Now, there are lots of different checklists and there's a, a, an, an overview of some of them uh, that are based on different types of research design. Um, so if you're looking at an observational study, you could use the STRO checklist. If you're using um, randomized control trials, you can look at consort uh, and so on. Um, but if we have a look at, say, the randomized control trial, um, you will have some information about the checklist, where it was developed. There's a word version. So what this is looking at is for a randomized control trial, all the different things that um, are markers of good quality. So were what were the specific objectives and hypotheses? Were they stated clearly? Um, so um, it's thinking about things like the eligibility criteria. Were the eligibility, the inclusion, exclusion criteria clear? Did they make sense as well? So there's lots of things that you need to think about across the whole piece of research in terms of its rationale, um, how it's specified, its um, hypotheses, uh, whether the data it's collected um, will allow you really to test those hypotheses and so on. Um, the other uh, link I provided is to the Joanna Briggs Institute. Again, so these are by the Joanna Briggs Institute um, and these have um, some validity information in terms of how they've been applied. Uh, and again, you've got checklists for all sorts of different types of study. Um, so for example, you've got a checklist for quasi-experimental studies, um, so non-randomized experimental studies. So you've got a PDF or a Word document. And these are traditionally used um, for systematic reviews to judge the quality of research. But I think it can be really, if you find a piece of research that's really important, that's really useful, it can be helpful to apply these uh, for your own peace of mind really if you're looking at evidence informed decision making um, it can be a useful tool to go through uh, so there's some background to the tool and some explanation of what each of the items on the checklist means and how you need to apply it uh, and you can go through and get a sense of um, you know was there a control group um, you know were, were um, the appropriate statistical analysis used for the data um, what about the reliability of the way that outcomes um, were measured, things like that. Uh, so those all feed into the confidence you can have in the conclusions of the piece of research, uh, the conclusions drawn from the statistical analysis that they performed and so on. Um, it's, it's important also to think about who is doing the research. Does that party have a vested interest in some way? So again, a lot of journals are now requiring people who are reviewing research or to who are publishing research they have to clarify whether they have any potential conflicts of interest. Um, so it's, it's thinking about who's producing the research and the potential agenda they, they may have. So thinking just very briefly about the strengths and limitations then of statistics, um, some of the strengths of uh, statistics are that they can help you identify consistent patterns in data. So they can be very useful um, in terms of looking at broad patterns, identifying um, where variables seem to vary systematically together. They can give you sort of the, the big picture then. Um, if the research is done well, it can provide a means for you to generalize beyond your observed data from your sample back to the population that that uh, sample was drawn from. So you can think bigger again. What you have to be careful of with statistics though, are where people are trying to say that a hypothesis has been proved with the statistics. Um, we don't prove a, a hypothesis, um, but we can use statistics to provide support for it, um, if that's what they reflect. One of the limitations of statistics is that they 
they can be applied inappropriately and people can draw conclusions that go beyond what the statistics can actually tell them. So you have to be careful with that. One of the other issues is that there's a perception that sometimes statistics or statistical analysis can fix poor research design. Now, to some extent, they can control for some things um, that you can't control for research design, but they there is no substitute for a good research design. And if you're, um, the research design is poor, it will have an impact on the conclusions that can be can drawn for any statistics. So it's always worth uh, remembering that. And the final thing is the tendency for correlation, which is where we see um, patterns in data so that there's a systematic varying of scores, say, on one variable, and that, that's mirrored in some way by scores on another variable, so a correlation. People use that um, to infer causation, so that X causes Y. Um, but actually, all we can say in, in with statistics is really that there seems to be a meaningful pattern between the two. And we can use theory to try and in, infer causation, but um, statistics can't prove it, if that makes sense. And a final issue, uh, and you'll see this actually if you read uh, research about mixed methods um, research, which is where you combine quantitative with qualitative and so on, um, that quite often statistics can give you the bigger picture in, in some respects, um, but what they can't tell you are necessarily the lived experience um, that, that people have. So I think there's always an element that they can answer certain types of research question but not all of them. And so uh, there's there's also no substitute for qualitative uh, research uh, to answer some types of research question about experiences and the meanings that people attach to experiences and so on. So just to revisit the learning outcomes, um, it's very much been a whistle-stop tour, but hopefully you should be able to describe what the null hypothesis significance testing framework kind of is. Um, you should have an idea now of what p-values are, what effect sizes are, um, what research design refers to and what parametric data assumptions are. You should have an idea of the different inferential statistical techniques you can use to explore uh, differences between groups or time points as well as relationships between variables. Um, and you should be aware of tools that are out there to help you think about quality assurance or quality appraisal in quantitative research. Things like the equator network with all of the checklists and, and things. And you should have some idea of the strengths and the limitations of statistics and research, although there are lots of others that we haven't had a chance to look at today. In terms of resources, uh, I would recommend looking at the, um, as I did in part one, Julie Pallant's book. She has a, a very easy to follow um, approach to statistics. So if you're interested in understanding more about correlation, about t-tests, about ANOVAs, all of which I've kind of referred to in today's session. Um, there's also, you've got Dancy and Reedy's book, um, which is available, uh, physical copies in the library. Again, that's they've got a very easy to follow approach as well. Um, Bryce Burt, um, uh, physical copies as well, and has a, a very easy to follow, but in depth kind of uh, approach to uh, the underpinnings of statistics as well as some of the, the main, the core types in inferential statistics. And some of the really useful um, resources, you've got things like Laird Statistics, you've got Eugene O'Loughlin's um, YouTube videos where he talks through doing these by hand. So if you want to look at how a t-test is calculated by hand, um, because we've looked at things like variance, we've looked at Cohen's D, um, but we didn't look at how the t-test was calculated by hand. He has a really good um, video on that, or a couple of videos on um, doing t-tests by hand. There's also a free uh, online textbook that Daniela Navarro has written, um, and there's a link there, uh, plus her blog. Um, so these are all really useful things that you can access, uh, mostly for free. Um, as I said, Laird Statistics, you pay a nominal free fee really for uh, perhaps a month, and you can access um, their resources. If there's a particular type of analysis that you want to conduct and interpret, then they're probably one of the best um, resources to go to. But that's the end of um, part two. Um, I hope it's been useful. Um, but um, thank you very much.